Hello and welcome, or welcome back. I'm the Tilted Crown Gourmet. The holidays are quickly approaching, and it's time that we generally either host family or friends over to our homes. And the fundamentals of hosting a big event are the same, whether it be the holidays, Thanksgiving, Friendsgiving, Christmas, or just a gathering of friends and family. So I'm going to be showing you the techniques that I utilize to make my day of event as seamless and as stress-free as possible. First, you want to start by creating your menu. Once you've created your menu, you want to create a shopping list. Once you create your shopping list, go out get all of your ingredients. Then you want to time each item that you're going to make to see which ones you can make prior to the day of your event. So maybe you do the prep for these specific items, put them in the refrigerator or even in the freezer, and then you cook them the day of. So without further ado, let's get some prep done and let's get cooking. To start my stuffing, I want to make my cornbread. So to my bowl of flour, I'm gonna be adding my sugar or cornmeal, baking powder, and salt. Give it a little bit of a stir. Now to your milk, add your beaten egg, your vegetable oil, and your melted butter. Give that a bit of a stir and whisk it in to your flour cornmeal mixture. Once it's whisked, go ahead and get you some softened butter and put that in your pan that you're gonna make your cornbread in. Now granted, you can do this in muffin tins as well, but because I'm gonna be using it for stuffing, I'm gonna do it in an eight by eight pan. Get it nice and buttery, makes it easier when it's time to remove the cornbread after it's baked. Go ahead and get that and put it in. And you hear that beep? That was the oven finishing its preheat to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're gonna bake for approximately 20 minutes. After putting my cornbread in the oven, I've not had idle hands. I've also cleaned all of those dishes. That way I stay on top of the dishes so it keeps the kitchen clean and allows me to continue the cooking process. I've gotten together all my ingredients for my cranberry sauce. So that's gonna be next. For your cranberry sauce, you wanna go ahead and add in your orange juice to your cranberries, the zest of an orange. And remember, when you're zesting your oranges, you zest it this way, because this way you can see exactly where you've already zested, so you don't end up getting any of the pit, which is the bitter part of the orange. And you'll see a lot of people not zest this way, but it's, this tool is designed to be utilized in this way because you see how all your zest ends up in the top. Sugar, I add some sriracha, salt, pepper, and last but not least, some Grand Marnier. Turn your heat to low, and you may have to cook this for about 30 to 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, depending upon how your heat is on your particular cooktop. After your time has elapsed, want to go ahead and get your cornbread out and sit it over to let it cool. After you've allowed your cornbread to cool in the pan for approximately five minutes, turn it out onto a wire rack to allow it to complete its cooling process. After your time has elapsed, I would recommend using something like this if you want to make your cranberry sauce a little bit more smooth. Just go ahead and finish popping those cranberries. I like some of my cranberries to remain whole so I don't necessarily make it like a jelly because if you want jelly, they're smuckers. They do a much better job. I would also recommend that you go ahead and give it a little bit of a taste. Did you see, and this will thicken up. For me, this is perfect. It's the perfect balance, sweet, tart, and a little bit of heat from that sriracha. After you've gotten your cranberry sauce to the consistency that you want, Go ahead and put it into your serving dish, let it cool down, cover it, and then place it in the refrigerator. And this is a done dish. 
cranberry sauce is now checked off your list. So in 100% clear, full disclosure, it actually took me an hour and 15 minutes to make my cranberry sauce. Now, a lot of people would say, well, why did it take so long? Again, I use very low heat. People again will say, well, why is your heat so low? Just crank it up and they'll go ahead and pop and you'll be done in less than half the time. This is actually true. You can cook them under a much higher heat. However, you're gonna have a huge mess to clean up because as the cranberries pop, they're gonna be popping so violently and so many all at the same time that it's gonna create a lot of spatter which gets all over your stove. So all that time that you thought you've saved by using a higher heat, you're gonna spend that time cleaning your stove. So low and slow is the way to go on this particular dish. Once your cornbread has cooled, cut it into cubes and place it into a big bowl. I generally cover mine with a clean kitchen towel and let it sit overnight because you want it to get a little stale, a little hard. And then you continue making your stuffing the following day. Our next step is to blanch our beans for our casserole. So I have started a pot of water to boil and added some salt. And what we wanna do is just simply cut off the ends that attach to the vine and toss them into your bowl. Once your water is boiling, go ahead and place some of your beans in. And you're gonna want to blanch them for about four minutes. After four minutes, you wanna remove them, place them into your ice bath to arrest the cooking process and to reserve the color. While those are cooling, you're gonna start your next batch and you'll continue doing this until you've blanched all of your beans. Keep in mind, you do not want to allow your beans to become waterlogged. You just want them in there long enough to arrest that cooking process. So touch them with your hands and when they're cool, you want to go ahead and move them over to your colander because you want to drain them because you don't want them to be soggy. You want them to be firm, but cooked. Now that all of your beans have been blanched, we're going to wrap them in a paper towel and there's some residual moisture on them, which is great. So we're gonna wrap them into a paper towel and then we're gonna place them into a Ziploc bag and place the Ziploc bag into the refrigerator until needed for our casserole. Time for our carrots. I have replaced all of the water in the pot and brought it back up to a boil, salted water, lightly salted. We're gonna add our carrots and we're going to let these cook for about three minutes. Following their time in the hot tub, they will also go into the ice plunge to arrest the cooking process and to help lock in those colors. Following their cold plunge, they too will be wrapped in paper towels, placed into a Ziploc bag, and placed into the refrigerator until needed later. Hello, and welcome back to day two of our meal prep for our Friendsgiving or Thanksgiving dinner. Again, this can be utilized for any type of large event that you're gonna be hosting. Anyway, today we're gonna to be starting with our chorizo sausage um, stuffing. I've done some prep beforehand. I'll be showing you that in a minute. But remember, if you don't like chorizo or can't use chorizo, don't put it in your dish. Also, last night, I soaked cranberries in some Captain Morgan spiced rum. Again, you don't have to use cranberries. You could use raisins. If you don't want to use spiced rum, you can use brandy. You could use cognac. If you don't want to use alcohol, feel free to use apple juice or orange juice. It's all, it's all up to you. So let's get some prep done and let's continue cooking. For our stuffing, of course, we have our cornbread. We have our chorizo. We have our cranberries that have been soaked in our Captain Morgan's rum, our mise en place, which of course is our onion, carrots, and celery, our Granny Smith apples, ham, roughly chopped roasted chestnuts. We have our herb blend, which is shit sage, rosemary, and thyme, some diced garlic, 
salt and pepper. We're going to be starting our stuffing by caramelizing our pork chorizo. And remember, if you don't want to use chorizo, you could use spicy Italian sausage. You could use, if you don't want spicy, you can use sweet Italian sausage. It's up to you. It depends upon the flavor profile that you want for your dish. But what we make sure that we do want to do is cook it very well. We want some caramelization. We want to break it up and take our time and cook it really well. See, we're getting that caramelization there. That's what we're looking for. We want that caramelization like that. Now that your chorizo is out, we're gonna go ahead and add in our onions. And we do wanna add our onions in before our carrots and celery because we wanna caramelize our onions. And if you have all of the moisture from the carrots and celery, you won't be able to caramelize your onions. Now that we have our caramelization, those look really good. We're gonna go ahead and add our carrots and celery, and we can add both of those at the same time because it's okay that we're gonna get that moisture out. I'm gonna cook this for about five minutes before we go to our next step. As that continues to cook, let's go ahead and add in our ham. Now, if you don't wanna use ham, then don't use ham, that's okay. But for this dish, I'm using ham. Next, let's go ahead and add in our herbs. Once again, that was sage, rosemary, and thyme. If you don't like sage, rosemary, and thyme, feel free to substitute um, one or more of them and put in the herbs that you enjoy. Vegetables are soft. We're gonna go ahead and add in our garlic, and we're only gonna cook for about a minute. And at that point, our veggie mixture is done. Now that our sausage is done, into our bowl with our cornbread, we're gonna add our veggies. Remember, these need to be soft, not mushy, just soft. Give it a little bit of a stir. And note, I don't crumble up my cornbread. A lot of people will crumble it up into crumbs. I, perf I don't particularly care for it that way because as you're tossing it, it's gonna tend to want to start to crumble. So I like to start with cubes. So after we've added our vegetable mixture, we're gonna go ahead and add our parsley. And you can add as much or as little parsley as you want. I like parsley, so I tend to add a little bit more. Give that a mix. Remember those drunken cranberries? This is where they come in. So we're gonna go ahead and put those in. If you wanted to use raisins, you can omit this step completely if you so chose. I had my apples in some lemon water to help them from getting too crazy brown. I drained them off. Once again, those are Granny Smith apples. The roasted chestnuts, rough chopped. And give those a toss. Let's go ahead and add our chorizo. And mind you, I'm not adding the oil. Just the meat. Add some salt and pepper. And last but not least, you will either, I'm gonna add buttermilk. However, you could add chicken stock if you so choose, um, or regular milk. Starting with the cup, because we want it to hold together. So a cup may not be enough. We'll find out shortly. And also, if you like dry stuffing, you can use less um, binder. But you see, that's what I'm looking for. See how that's sticking together? That's what I want. I have buttered my dish I'm putting my stuffing in, and I've heavily buttered the dish, actually. And then we're just gonna add in our stuffing. You want a dish, when you get your stuffing in it, you want to have about an inch and a half to two inches of stuffing. If you were getting ready to bake this off, you would sprinkle it with additional parsley and then put it into the oven uncovered. However, because I'm doing it ahead of time, I will cover this in plastic wrap and I will put it in the refrigerator. And when I pull it out an hour before I'm gonna cook it, because I want this container to come up to closer to room temperature so it doesn't shatter when it goes into the oven, I will then sprinkle it with parsley and put it into the oven. As a footnote, you could make this dish 
five days before your event and leave it in the refrigerator or you can make it several weeks ahead of your event and place it into the freezer. Now that my stuffing is done, quote unquote, and in the refrigerator until the day of event, I'm going to move on to my turkey. With this particular turkey, this turkey was frozen. I bought it several days ago and I've left it in the refrigerator to uh, defrost. However, it is still not 100% defrosted, which is perfectly fine actually for this particular brining method. This is going to be a dry brine. So what I've done is I've washed the turkey and I've patted it dry and remove the tail with some shears because number one, it doesn't taste very good and it doesn't add anything to your dish. So remove that and you can put that aside for your stock later for turkey stock or if you want to just throw it away, that's fine too. So with my turkey, what I have a tendency to do is I get my wings and I try to tuck them underneath the bird because I just find that that way you actually don't need to foil the wings because they will not burn. So I put my wings underneath my bird. Now with our padded dry turkey in this, I have salt, pepper, Cajun seasoning, and fresh rosemary. So what I want to do, and as you notice, it's in a separate dish. Why a separate dish? Because I have hands that are touching raw turkey. So what I want to do is I want to rub this all over my turkey. And yes, you will also put some on the inside. I've put my spices on my turkey. So now it will go in the refrigerator uncovered until the day of event. So I will not touch this turkey anymore until it's time for it to go into the smoker. I lied, one final step. You do want to go ahead and truss your drumsticks. That way you don't have to worry about doing it later. So just give it a tie across the other leg. And what I like to do is to bring this underneath. We're going to continue with our green bean casserole bundles. First off, in our bowl, we're adding in our cream of mushroom soup. So you're gonna do your standard sauce, followed by your milk, soy sauce, some freshly ground pepper, your French's beans. I like to give it a little stir at this point, just to start getting things mixed up here. And remember those wonderful blanched beans that we did on day one? Well, they're making a reappearance out of the bag and into our sauce. I'm gonna go ahead and fold those beans into our sauce. Now that they're nice and mixed up, these will go back into the Ziploc bag that they were originally in until the day of. And then we'll wrap them in bacon and bake them off but this dish is 90% done. We are closing in on the end of day two. Right now we're gonna be making our butternut squash soup. I usually call it my one-off soup because it has one onion, one butternut squash, one apple, one bay leaf, you know, one clove of garlic. You get the picture. Anyway, I've preheated the oven to 400 degrees I've cubed the butternut squash and I've cut the apple and the onion into wedges, six wedges to be precise. Now we're going to drizzle with some olive oil, we're gonna sprinkle with some salt and pepper and give it a little bit of a toss. Now we're gonna put this into the oven for approximately 40 minutes or until a fork inserted into your butternut squash goes in easily. Now that our vegetables and fruit are in the oven, we're gonna go ahead and make a little sachet. So we're gonna have our bay leaf, our thyme, and our garlic, and we're going to tie this up with some twine because we're gonna be putting this into our chicken stock and we want to have make it so that it's easy for us to remove later. So you can do yours however you want. I do mine this way or tie it up. And I leave this long for a reason, and I will show you what that reason is shortly. While our veggies and fruit 
are in the oven. We're gonna go ahead and put our pot on medium. And to our pot, we're gonna be adding in our homemade chicken stock. And to that, we're gonna add our satchel. And I am going to tie that on to the edge of the pot, simply so it is like super, super easy to find. So your time has elapsed for your veggies. Go ahead and pull them out of the oven. And we're going to add them into our soup. Now that all your vegetables are in, and of course your fruit, your apple, we want to bring that to a boil. Once it comes to a boil, we want to reduce it to a simmer and simmer for 20 minutes. Now that our stock has come back to a boil, we're going to reduce to a simmer, and I cover mine, and we'll be coming back in 20 minutes. And just a reminder, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Turn on the notification bell and leave a comment. Our additional 20 minutes has elapsed, so it's time for us to Turn our heat off. I'm gonna go ahead and remove aromatics here. Then we're going to use our immersion blender and blend up our soup. Season with a little salt and pepper. Give your soup a taste and make sure your seasonings are right. That's absolutely perfect. I will then put that in the refrigerator until the day of, which I'll then reheat it, and the soup is done. Welcome back to day three of our prep for our epic dinner. If you're enjoying this content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and leave a comment down below. We're in the home stretch of this epic adventure. We have one more day, and that's show day. So stay tuned, let's continue getting some prep done, and let's continue cooking. This morning, we're gonna start by prepping our lamb. This is a super, super easy process because we're just gonna cut some slits into our lamb and we're gonna stuff them with garlic. And you can use as many cloves or as few cloves of garlic as you choose. Next, I like to insert some rosemary. After you've stuffed your leg of lamb, put it on top of a bed of rosemary Sprinkle with some salt, followed by pepper, and last but not least, add your red wine. Our next step is to cover it, and we're gonna place it into the refrigerator overnight, but we're gonna flip it halfway through. Our next step is to get started with our rolls. To your pot, you're gonna add your water, followed by your sugar, your shortening, and your salt. We're gonna bring that to a boil, and then we'll be back. Now that it's at a boil, we wanna turn off your heat, and we're going to allow it to cool. The reason this needs to cool is because it cannot be over 110 degrees Fahrenheit, otherwise you're gonna end up killing your yeast. So again, at this point, we're just gonna let it sit and allow it to cool to below 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So to my flour, I'm gonna add my warm water. I've heated this to 102 degrees Fahrenheit. I will then add my yeast, our eggs, and then we're gonna add our original mixture that we made with the sugar, the lard, and the water, our shortening, then go in. This has cooled to 99 degrees. Now we're gonna put that in a warm spot to let it rise. I've removed this out of my proofing oven Next, I will get it and transfer it into a smaller bowl, cover it tightly with plastic wrap, and put it in the refrigerator overnight. And tomorrow, we'll continue the process of making our rolls. Also, if you don't have a proofing oven, that's okay. You can simply leave, put your dough in your oven and leave the oven light on with the door closed and that will produce enough heat to help your dough rise. Let's start our pumpkin brulee. First off, gonna use our mini pumpkins. Voila. And then we're going to take out the inside. We're gonna be using the flesh portion in order to naturally flavor our sauce, or our 
custard and we can save the seeds for later. And when you're done hollowing out your pumpkin, it should basically look like this. And then we're gonna set this aside until we get the other ones prepared. After you've cleaned out all of your pumpkins, now you have ramekins basically. So naturally formed ramekins for your pumpkin brulee. I believe that this is a really nice presentation for your guest. We will put our pumpkin into our pot, followed by our heavy whipping cream, cinnamon stick, five cloves, a knob of ginger, nutmeg, a little salt, sugar, and we wanna go ahead and split our vanilla bean and want to scoop out. Before I was so rudely interrupted by my camera losing power, scrape out your vanilla bean seeds, put them into your pan along with the vanilla bean pod because we're gonna be straining this out later. We're gonna go ahead and heat this on low and as soon as it starts to bubble, we're gonna turn it off. The reason that you're taking your time with your pumpkin cream is you really want that pumpkin to infuse the flavors into your cream as well as your vanilla bean, your ginger, your cinnamon because remember these are whole spices so they're going to be strained off. They're not going to continue imparting any flavor once the cooking process is done. So low and slow and remember as soon as it starts to bubble around the edges we're going to pull it off the heat. We're not quite there yet. So as I'm starting to get some bubbles right along the edge, it's time to turn off the heat. And then I'm gonna run that through my chinois. The reason I like to use a chinois is because it, you really can push all of that liquid out without getting really any of your solids. And plus it's just nice and large. In my bowl, I have my five egg yolks. Remember, the enemy of a really good brulee air bubbles. So when I beat those eggs, I use the spoon. And then I'm going to temper them with our mixture. So basically, we don't end up with scrambled eggs. And I want all of those wonderful seeds from our vanilla bean in my custard. So I strain this again to help get rid of any additional bubbles, air bubbles. And you're gonna add water, and as you wanna go halfway up your pumpkins. Place your pumpkin brulee into your preheated oven that has been preheated to 225 degrees Fahrenheit or 110 degrees centigrade for approximately one and a half to two hours, or until the sides of the dessert are solid, but the center is still jiggly. to a close. The brulees have come out, the pumpkin brulees have come out of the oven, as I showed you earlier. I let them sit in the water for an additional about 10-15 minutes. Then I pull them out and set them on a towel on my counter for them to completely cool. You don't want to lower the temperature of your brulee too quickly, so you don't want to go from oven to refrigerator because that will crack your brulee, um, your pumpkin brulee, and you really don't want that. You want to have, you know, the nice crackly sugar coating on top, but you don't want to have a cracked brulee. Anyway, that's the conclusion of day number three. Don't forget, if you're enjoying this content, like, subscribe, and share. See you tomorrow for the main event. So today is show day. This is what the dry brine turkey looks like as it comes out of the refrigerator. I'm going to let it sit for about an hour and a half to two hours. I want it to come up to room temperature because remember, this had been a frozen turkey and when I put the dry brine on, it still was not fully defrosted. So it's going to be a very, very cold bird. In the meantime, I've gone ahead and got my other ingredients ready, so butter, rosemary, Cajun seasoning, salt and pepper, and I'm going to mix that up. And before I put the turkey on the smoker, I am going to slather it in this butter mixture. We're going to continue getting things together for 
our turkey. So the smoker is not on quite yet. However, prior to me lighting the smoker, it's an electric smoker, so actually plugging it in. I've done a mix of apple juice and water and a mixture of mesquite wood chips and cherry wood chips. Now, when you're going to um, inject your turkey, if you choose to inject it, I recommend it. I think it helps to keep it moist. Never put your inject, uh, never put your needle from your injectable into your bottle because you're gonna be contaminating your entire bottle of injector liquid. Now, granted, you can make it from scratch as well if you so choose, but even if you make it from scratch, you need to have a separate section to do your, um, to pull your injectable liquid from so that you don't contaminate what's left. So just pull some up and if you watch, you'll see the breasts expand, but you're gonna put it more than in the breast. You're gonna put it, put a little bit everywhere on your turkey and be generous. So my smoker is on, so now I want to butter my turkey. Just get it and put it over the skin. This really, really helps with flavor. And make sure that you butter the entire thing, even the bottom. And after you've buttered your turkey, this is basically what it looks like. But we're not done. I sprinkle a little bit more Cajun seasoning on the top, followed by a little bit of pepper. And last but not least, we're gonna add some salt. I know you think, oh my goodness, there's so much salt, but you're looking at a lot of meat and a cooking process over the course over seven hours. So you're gonna need those seasonings. And now we're just gonna let it sit until our smoker is ready. So I've inserted my meter thermometer and even though that turkey has been out for two hours, if you notice, the internal temperature is still only 44 degrees. So, as I said, you can take it out plenty of time, don't have to worry about any food pathogens or anything because there's a lot of mass there and it takes a while for that mass to heat up. To continue, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up our bundles are green bean casserole bundles. Just an interesting twist to an old favorite. So I've pre-measured these out into my little bundles and just wrap them in your bacon. It's a little bit messy, but that's okay. And place them into your baking dish, seam side down. I like to make sure that they're nice and in there. So seam side down. Let's do one more. Seam side down. Now that our bundles are made, we're gonna wrap those in saran wrap and back in the refrigerator they go because now this dish is done except for uh, the final cooking in the oven. We're gonna do some prep for our garlic mashed potatoes, specifically roasted garlic mashed potatoes. So we're gonna cut off the top of our head, drizzle it with some olive oil, gonna wrap it up. And we're gonna put this in our preheated 400 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes. Another thing that I do to help make my day of event as stress-free as possible, I pre-plan all of my dishes and I label them. So that way I know that every dish that I'm making has the appropriate serving utensil. So last night I labeled all of my dishes, or so like turkey gravy, turkey platter, my bundles, my mashed potatoes, and I even created a spot over on this side for my cranberry sauce. So just one of those things that I do to help make my day of event as stress-free as possible. Remove your lamb from the refrigerator approximately an hour before you're gonna put it in the smoker. Because I marinated this in red wine, I'm placing it on a wire rack in order for moisture to drain out. To make my red wine gravy for my lamb, I've taken the marinade and placed it into a pot and it's gonna to come to a boil. It needs to boil a minimum of five minutes. Hence, it needs to be at a rolling boil for at least five minutes, which will kill off any bacteria and it makes the marinade safe for consumption. 
During that time, I'm also gonna go ahead and make my roux. So I'm melting my butter, and once that's melted, I'll add my flour. And for some extra flavor, I'm gonna add some beef bouillon powder as well. Add in your flour and mix it so it doesn't burn. Basically, you're wanting to cook the flour to get rid of any of that raw flour taste. While that's boiling, I'm gonna add in some rosemary, garlic and shallots, and these are just rough chopped because I'm gonna be straining them later. Add your beef bouillon powder to your red wine sauce. After five minutes, go ahead and whisk in your roux and reduce your heat to a simmer. I have simmered this for an additional five minutes and you see it's starting to thicken up. If you want it thicker, that's okay, but I'm actually pretty happy with that because I have nappe. Because you have to remember that your gravy will thicken up as it cools. So give it a taste. Make sure you don't need to add any salt or pepper. For me, that's absolutely perfect. So pull it off the heat and we're gonna strain it. To make my gravy for my turkey, I've gotten some of the fat from the drippings of the turkey. And I'm gonna heat that up and to that, I'm gonna be adding flour. I'm gonna make my roux that way. So instead of adding additional fat out via butter, as an example, I'm just using the fat that I skimmed off from the drippings from the turkey, and I will add flour to that. To the roux, we're gonna again add cloves of garlic and rough chopped shallot. Give it some extra flavor. Then we're gonna add in our drippings. I just think there's a lot of flavor, especially because we had it on the smoker. Bring that to a simmer to help balance out those flavors and to thin it out a little bit. I'm going to add a little homemade chicken stock, just a little bit. They'll have nappe and we're going to give it a little taste. Oh, very good. Now we're going to go ahead and strain that out and reserve it till later. For your rolls, pull your dough out of the refrigerator and pinch off pieces the size of the rolls that you want, keeping in mind they will rise again. Form them with your hands and then roll them on your countertop into balls. Place them onto your cookie sheet or into a high-sided baking dish. A purely optional step is while they're doing their second rise, you can top them in some melted butter and then top with a little bit of salt, just a little dust and a salt. Place your stuffing into your preheated 375 degree Fahrenheit or 190 degree centigrade oven for 45 minutes uncovered. As your rolls rise, place your potatoes into salted boiling water for about 20 minutes or until a fork or knife can be inserted easily. After you've boiled your potatoes, remove from the heat and drain. Place back into a warm pot and add your warm melted butter so you're not cooling your potatoes, along with your warmed cream, your balsamic, your roasted garlic from earlier, white pepper, and salt. Utilizing a potato masher, mash until your desired consistency is reached, leaving them in your warm pot until they're ready to be served. Place your lightly covered green bean casserole bundles in along with your stuffing for 40 minutes. To plate your soup course, place your warm soup into shallow bowls topped with fresh parsley and your Cajun spice pumpkin seeds from our mini pumpkins. Place your rolls into the oven along with your other items and cook for 12 minutes. To complete your honey candied carrots, place your butter into your saucepan followed by your blanched baby carrots giving them a stir to coat. Next, we'll add in our honey, mixing to coat well, followed by our freshly cracked black pepper, and heat thoroughly. Remove your corn from your smoker after approximately 30 minutes and platter, adding any remaining butter mixture to them. Now that your food has come out of the oven all at the same time, platter it as it is now time to eat. Relish in the fact that you have made an amazing culinary presentation for not only yourself, but also for your guests with very little or no stress.
the food was lovely. Uh, my favorite was probably the mashed potatoes, but it was all very good. Everything was delicious. Mashed potatoes and that pumpkin brulee. Is that what it's called? Brulee? Yes. Mm -hmm. I thought that everything was good. I love the turkey, mashed potatoes. It was all good. Stepping. Very good. Oh, the bread. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. I'm the Tilted Crown Gourmet. Bon Appetit.